Hi, welcome to my lecture and demo on data frame properties uh, in our GT 101 workshop. My name is Stuart Bruce. I'm GIS program coordinator at Washington College. Now, first, I'm going to open up our GT 101 course here. And I'm going to scroll down and show you the data frames lesson. And you can see here we have a number of different exercises in here. Um, this looks like it could be a pretty long lesson. Uh, most of the exercises are actually very short. And because data frame properties, uh, if you change settings in one section and then uh, start the next exercise, uh, everything has to be sort of precisely set at the beginning in order for the lesson to work. So what we do when you go to your GT101 folder on data frames. Basically, we have a number of map documents. Uh, and when you start another part of each uh, exercise, you'll have to open up a new map document. Uh, this just to make sure that you start at the right spot. So the initial um, map document that you open up is data frame projections. I'm going to go ahead and double click and open that up. Okay, when this opens up, you're going to see a map of Pennsylvania. And if you're familiar with Pennsylvania at all, you'll understand that the shape that you see on the screen of this particular projection is not really suited for displaying Pennsylvania correctly. If I go up to the data frame properties where it says layers, and I right click, open up properties. I go to the coordinate system tab, and I can see I'm in this GCS North American coordinate system. GCS stands for geographic coordinate system. And basically what this means is this data is not projected. So what I want to do is I want to change the projection of my data frame to match something that's more appropriate for Pennsylvania. Now in our GT102 course, we have an entire lesson on projections. Uh, we're going to go into projections in a lot more detail. Um, for this lesson, I'm just really trying to show you some of the basic uh, sort of settings in our map. Now, to change the coordinate system, I go to predefined. I want to go to a projected coordinate system. And if I'm looking to project, say, a state like Pennsylvania, then typically you would use a state plane projected coordinate system. And if I open that up, you're left with a whole host of choices. Typically, I would use uh, NAD 1983 in feet. And I would scroll down until I saw Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania actually has two state plane coordinates. This is something that uh, will be explained later on. But for now, just select the state plane south and then click OK. Give us a little warning uh, error. Just sort of, a, it's not really an error, it's just sort of a disclaimer. And we're going to go ahead and hit yes. Now we can see that Pennsylvania is a little bit shorter. It's not quite as long as it was uh, showing in that previous projection. A little more realistic um, display. Now if I zoom out, from Pennsylvania, which I'm going to do. What I want to show you the effect of using a projection that's designed specifically for Pennsylvania is when we look at the rest of the country, we can see the rest of the country is a little bit out of whack. Probably never seen a um, map of America looks quite like this. And then if we go out and look at the world scale, we can see the rest of the planet is very, very much distorted. I'm going to go back to the United States here. So if we want a projection that works well for all of uh, sort of North America, we would go back to our data frame properties by double clicking on layers. We could go to predefined projected coordinate systems. But this time, instead of picking a coordinate system for a state, we would pick a continental coordinate system. So we'd expand that. We want to display North America correctly, so we would expand North America. 
And then we have a number of choices that we can pick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pick North America Lambert Conformal Conic. Pretty uh, common projection for North America. And then I'll click OK. And now we can see America represented more like you would see on a map. If we zoom out to the world scale, you can see that why that works well for North America, it doesn't work well for the rest of the world. So if we want to have a good world projection, we would come back to our data frame and we're going to go predefined projected coordinate systems and we'll go down here and select world. A common world projection might be something like Mercator. If I'm going to select Mercator and click OK. And you've probably seen maps of the world like this before. Now Mercator has some issues with it. Um, it distorts land masses in the North and the South Poles. Specifically, if you look at Greenland, you can see that Greenland in this projection is larger than South America. So I'm going to switch to something that doesn't have quite so much distortion. So instead of the Mercator, I'm going to select one of my favorites, the Robinson. Click OK. Now we can see we have a little bit less distortion and the land masses are represented a little bit better. Now in the exercise you're going to do, you'll have a chance to play around with this a little bit and uh, you can have a little bit of fun uh, seeing how you can distort the planet. Now we go ahead and close this. And we're going to go to our next um, exercise. And to do that, we're going to open up the data frame units of measure. Now this little exercise has as its goal primarily to show you how to modify the display units at the bottom of the screen. So the default for ArcGIS is to display this in degrees, minutes, and seconds. And I want to change that to say decimal degrees. So if I open up the data frame properties and I go to my data frame tab, one of these tabs here, the general tab, I'm going to go ahead and change this to decimal degrees and click OK. Now notice down the bottom, nothing happened. There is some kind of bug in ArcGIS 10 where this doesn't work. I haven't had time to call tech support on it, but we have figured out how to fix it. So if you want to see in degrees, um, excuse me, you want to see in decimal degrees, first you have to change it to feet and then click OK. See down here it's in feet. Then you go back and change it from feet to decimal degrees and click OK. So now you see down here we have it in decimal degrees. And this is actually what most of your GPS units will read. One of these days when I have an extra hour or so, I'll have to file a complaint with ESRI. So that's really uh, pretty much all um, that exercise is going to show you. So I'm going to go ahead and close um, this version of ArcMap. And we're going to open up the data frame map grids map document. Now in this exercise, I'm going to show you how to turn grids on. So if we go to our data frame properties, double click on the word layers. And then we select in the data frame properties, we select the grids tab. We can create a new reference grid. Many maps that you'll see will have these grids on them. And uh, you can do that in ArcMap. So I'm going to go ahead and select New Grid. This gives you a bunch of options here. You can play around with this some of the exercise. I'm going to go ahead and select the Graticule. And I'm going to click my Next tab. And then I can pick the intervals. So in this case, I'd like to have a parallel every one degree and a meridian every one degree. I'm going to go ahead and uh, Notice I can change the appearance and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to click Next. And there's some options here you can change. I'm just going to leave them the way they are and click Next. Uh, you can put a border at the edge, uh, some other things that you can do. And I'm going to click Finish. Then I'm going to
going to select OK. And you'll notice you don't see a grid. The grid only appears in the layout view of your map. So I have to come down here to the bottom here. And I'm going to switch over to the layout view. And now I have a grid placed upon my map. The exercise will have you sort of play around with this a little bit and come up with a nice little uh, printed map layout. That's really all there is to grids. So I'm going to go ahead and close this map document. And we're going to go ahead and open up next the measuring map document. And the purpose of this uh, exercise is really to show you the measuring tool. Very useful tool. You can see it here, a little ruler with a couple arrows. I'm going to go ahead and open that tool. And within this tool, we can measure lines, areas. We can actually click on any feature and get some measurements from that. We can do cumulative. Um, so if you're measuring multiple distances, you can add them. You can pick your units of measurement, for example, distance. I can pick whatever distance I want to have. If you're doing area, you can select whatever area unit you want to measure. And then here we have a clear results. And at the end here, we have measurement type. Now the default is planar, and I suggest you leave it there. Um, these options that are here are something new in ArcGIS 10 that honestly, I really haven't had a chance to thoroughly review. Uh, I do not believe any of them apply when you're measuring distances over a uh, short distance. Let's start with the measure tool. Now in the exercise, we ask you to measure the distance from Rosstown Road and the inter intersection of Carlisle down to Canal Road and Carlisle. I'm going to go ahead and turn the air photo off for right now. And I'm going to zoom in, move this out of the way a little bit. So to start my measurement, I grab my measure line tool. I come up, and what you want to notice is, as you approach a feature, it snaps to the feature. So if I come up here, I'm going to snap right to that intersection, and I'm just going to move my mouse along the road. It's helping me out by snapping to the feature. So this makes my distance measurement a little bit more accurate. The more points you put on the line, uh, probably the more accurate you're going to be. And I'm going to come all the way down here to the intersection of Carlisle and Canal Street. Now, when I get to the end, I'll double click. And I can see that my distance is approximately 29,897 feet. Now, if I wanted to see what that looked like in miles, all I'd have to do is come and change my units from feet to miles. And there's my distance in miles. Now, notice I didn't have to remeasure it automatically changed it. So if I wanted to see it in kilometers, I could just pick kilometers. So pretty handy uh, little functionality. Now if I wanted to measure an area, I'm going to come down here to these two little dots here, turn my air photo back on. Of course this is Dover, Pennsylvania, and one of the first adopters of our curriculum were students at Dover Area High School, which is right here. Now, what I'd like to do is measure the area of the Dover Area School property. So I'm going to pick my area tool, and I'm going to go ahead and measure this in acres. I'm going to clear my previous measurement. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a polygon around what looks like the school property. Now, you don't have to be exactly know where the boundary is, but you can kind of guess where the school is. So I measure that. It looks like I came up with about 25 acres of land for the school property. Now, another thing that you can do is you can exactly and precisely measure between two points. So here we have a dot, uh, basically a spatial feature, the school layer on top of, uh, I think this is a middle school to the high school. And if we grab our measuring tool, we will snap directly to that point. And then we can draw a line and snap directly to the other point. And we'll see that the distance between those two points is exactly 0.421297 kilometers. So that's a useful feature that you can uh, precisely 
measure the distance between two spatial features. Another useful tool in the measure tool was the measure of feature. So if I click that and then come out here and click on one of these points, this will tell me the exact X and Y location. Now this data here is actually in a Pennsylvania state plane coordinate system. Coordinates are expressed in state plane as feet. So that would be my state plane coordinates. Now if I want to measure one of these roads out here, I can just come out, select a feature, click on it, and it would tell me that that line segment is exactly 322.172 feet. So some very useful things you can do with the measure tool, and that's just about all there is to it. So you can play around with that when you do the exercise. Okay, our next um, thing I'm going to explain is about map scale. We actually have three separate map documents we're going to use on that. Open up the first one. Now it's very important that you understand map scale. And we're looking at three separate sort of data, data, ah, data layers here. Uh, one on Chesapeake Bay, one on York County, and one on Dover Borough. Look at Chesapeake Bay first. Now you can see this covers a pretty large area. If we come up here and look at the data frame scale window, we'll notice that our scale is at 1 to about 6 million. This is considered a small scale map. If we zoom into York County School Districts, notice that our data frame scale is now 1 to about 400,000. This is considered a medium scale map. And if we zoom in on Dover Parcels, notice that our scale is now 1 to 11,000. This is considered a large scale map. So basically, sort of opposite of what you might think. The smaller the number after your colon here, the larger the scale of the map. Now, many maps are produced for municipal government purposes at about a scale of 2,400. So I'm going to go ahead and type 2400 here. This would be a 1 inch equals 2400 scale map. Sometimes you'll feel, you're, you will hear people talking about maps like this. They'll say 1 inch equals 200 feet. Well, how do they come up with that? Well, this ratio, what it means is that if I took a ruler and I were to put a ruler across the map here and I measured 1 inch on the map, that would be the same as 2,400 inches in real life. But if I had a scale of 1 inch equals 2,400 inches, it's kind of hard to imagine in your head how long is 2,400 inches. But if I convert that to feet, for example, 1 inch equals 200 feet, it's a little bit easier for us to fathom how long 200 feet is. And to get the 200 feet from a scale of 1 to 2,400, since there are 12 inches in a foot, we would just divide 2400 by 12 and then it gets the 1 inch equals 200 feet. So pretty basic uh, principles. That's all we're going to uh, really talk about uh, in terms of scale. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is national map accuracy standards. I'm going to go ahead and open up the map scale NMAS document. All right, and what we're looking at here is uh, we're still sticking with the Dover theme. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on a neighborhood here. And what I want you to notice is if you look at the air photo in the background and you look at these vector lines, you'll notice that the lines do not match the air photo. Now, I can tell you that the air photo is very accurate. Uh, it's it's done at a scale of, uh, I believe, 1 to 2,400. And the parcels are supposed to be accurate to 1 to 2,400. It doesn't look very accurate. But what the National Map Accuracy Standards do is they actually specify what's the allowable error. And in the exercise, you'll have a chance to explore that a little bit more. I'm just going to give you kind of, the, kind of the answer here. At a scale of 1 to 2,400, are 1 inch equals 200 feet. The national map accuracy standards indicate that the allowable error is about six or six feet or so. 
So if we grab our measuring tool, and we actually measure this distance, make our units feet, and we believe that that really belongs there, we can see that this is about 50 feet off. So clearly, these lines do not meet national map accuracy standards. I have run into examples um, where you'll see something like this, and it's actually not in error. And the classic example would be, um, let's say you're looking at these relatively high resolution um, aerial photographs generated by a county, and then you bring in a federal data set that's done at a completely different map scale. Let's say that you're looking at FEMA floodplain maps that were done at a scale of say one to 48,000 versus a one to 2,400 scale uh, aerial photograph. Well, the accuracy of the one to 2,400 scale will be plus or minus six feet. At that one to 48,000 scale, the accuracy might be plus or minus 40 feet. So in that case, the data doesn't look like it lines up, but if the data was designed at a different scale, that data is still accurate. It's just not precise for your base map. So just something to keep in mind when you're picking up data from different sources. And next, we're going to talk about reference scales. Let me go ahead and open up this map document. Now, reference scales can be very useful. And I want you to notice here in the screen that we notice that we have some text here. Uh, this number that you're seeing here is actually the year that the house was built. And notice what happens when I zoom out. See how the text is getting bigger? Because the text is always trying to draw at the same font size. And as we zoom out, the text just becomes this jumbled mess. We really can't, can't make any sense out of it. Now, if I go back to a scale of 1 to 2400, which I'm going to do, notice that the text fits very nicely inside the polygons. Now, what I want to do is I want to set a reference scale so that when I zoom out, the text will stay at the same font. So if I come over to the data frame properties, right click where it says layers, there's an option for reference scale. And I'm going to go ahead and set reference scale. So now my reference scale is set at 1 to 2400. And when I zoom out, my text will stay that 12 point font in reference to the scale of 1 to 2400. So notice how as I'm zooming out now, the font is getting smaller and smaller. It's not overwhelming the map. And then when I zoom in, it stays that scale. So if I zoom way in, it's going to be much bigger, but it's matching the reference scale. So this comes in pretty handy at times. Now the exercise has you do a couple other things uh, related to referencing. One of those has to do with your extents. So if I open up my layer properties, let's say for example that you're digitizing and you would like to make sure when you digitize that you're always viewing the base photo at a set scale. So if you set in your data frame properties, if you go and select the data frame tab, you can change your extent instead of being automatic, you can go fix scale. And let's say I want to work at the 2400 scale. I would type in 2400, hit enter. And what happens is, if you'll notice up here on our tools toolbar, notice how my zoom in, zoom out have been grayed out. So I can no longer zoom in and zoom out. I can only pan. And I can only view the map data at 1 to 2400. So if your project was designed to meet a certain national map accuracy standard, say at 1 to 2400, this is how you'd want to view the data to make sure that you're viewing the data, editing the data at the map scale for which the project has been defined. And if I were to be digitizing here, I'm pretty much guaranteeing that whoever was digitizing it could be me. You know, was, was basically digitizing at the scale that you should be. So that's all I'm going to say about that for right now.
All right, the last thing we're going to look at here is we're going to look at um, how to calculate some area and some perimeter um, parameters. So I'm going to open up this Calculate Geometry Map document. And we're going to learn how to get some additional um, spatial measurements out of ArcGIS. Now, this particular um, document here, uh, this is showing an area around Hershey, Pennsylvania. And if I turn off this land use, you can see that this is actually uh, where Hershey Park is. Now, if I turn off this 1970 image and turn on the current image, you can see Hershey Park area. Now, as I'm looking at this photo, um, I do want to point out that Hershey Park is actually right up here. So the area that we digitized for land use was not actually Hershey Park, but it was an area near Hershey Park. A little technical note there. Now, let's say I go ahead and open up the attribute table for land use 1970. And I look at my attribute table, and I see that we have digitized land use type, couple different land use types, and then we have a shape length and a shape area. Now the first question you should be asking yourself is, what are the units of measurement for these two numeric fields? The only way to know for sure is to go to the layer properties, click the, the coordinate system tab, and this will tell us that this is projected in NAD 83 Pennsylvania South and that our units of measurement are in feet. That means that these numbers are in feet. So if I look at the residential land use type, I can see that we have looks like approximately 12,632,716 square feet. Now that doesn't really give me a good comprehension of how much area there is. So I would like to see some of these measurements in something I would understand, such as acres. Now, to do that, I'm going to have to create an acre field. So inside your attribute table, you come over here to the upper corner, I hit this little drop down menu. There's an option to come here and add field. I'm going to call this field acres. And you'll have to trust me on this. Uh, we do explain some of this uh, in a later uh, exercise. But I'm going to pick the numeric type float. And I'm going to pick float because short integer and long integer do not allow for decimal places. And I want to have decimal places, so I have to either pick float or double. Float would be the preferred option for an acres measurement field. You just have to trust me on this. Then I simply click OK. And now I have this acres field. Now I'd also like to report it out in hectares. So I'm going to create a field. Hectares is the metric sort of equivalent of acres, not exactly the same unit, but uh, relatively close. I'm going to go ahead and hit add field. And I'm going to create a hectares field. And of course, I'm going to go with the float because I want decimal places. I'm going to click OK. Now to calculate the geometry, or what this value is in acres is really very, very simple. I simply select the header, header field here. I right click right on the word acres. In the resulting pull down menu, I'm going to come down here and select calculate geometry. It's going to tell me I'm, I'm doing something outside of an edit session. Uh, that's a OK. Now my properties area, I'm going to use the coordinate system of the data source. My units, I don't want them in square feet because that's what I have already. I'm going to click this arrow. And I'm going to pick Acres US. And I'm simply going to click OK. So I have 290 acres of residential land. Now if I want to report hectares and do the same thing, right click, select Calculate Geometry, change my units. This time I'm going to go to hectares, pick that, and click. OK. So there we go. And you can see there's actually a pretty big difference between hectares and acres. Almost looks like uh, one hectare is the equivalent of about three acres. Now, another useful thing to do would be to know what percentage of land use each type is. Now, to do that, I would simply have to divide 
total number of acres for each category by the sum total of acres, for example. So to get the sum total, if I click on this acres field and right click, I do have some um, things I can get out of this. Number one, I could pick up statistics. And what this tells me is the frequency distribution of the data. And I can see here, there's I have the count. So there's seven um, different polygons. I have the minimum size is 13 acres. The maximum size is 477. And if I pull this out of the way and look, you can see that matches up. There's my 13. There's my 477. And I have the sum total acres, which is 1099.041387. I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and copy this number by highlighting it. And then I'm going to right click and select copy because I'm going to use that sum here in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm going to add a new field. I'm going to call this field percent underscore land use. Again, I'm going to want to have potentially decimal points. So I'm going to select the float. I'm going to click OK. And in this case, I really can't use the calculate geometry because there's not an option to calculate percentage. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to open up what's known as the field calculator. If I right click on percent land use and I open up my field calculator. Now this is a little bit complicated, but I'm sure that you're going to figure this out. So notice here it says percent land use equals. So I just have to figure out what's the formula for percentage. So if I take the acres which in this case, if you look at the first row, would be 290 acres. And then I'm going to divide that by the sum total acres, which I remember I copied that from our statistics. So percent land use equal. Notice how it has a percent land use up here. You don't have to put that in the formula. Percent land use equals the acres divided by that. And I simply click OK. My fingers crossed here. Calculating records. And then I have my percent land use. Now notice that the percent land use is in 0 0.26. So if I want to see that expressed as a percentage, which we're used to see, I'm going to have to do something to it. So I go back to my field calculator, open that up. Notice my formula is still there. And what I really need to do is I need to multiply this by 100. I go ahead and pick my multiplication button and I just type in 100. And I go ahead and click OK. And now I have percentage. So residential makes up 26% of the land use. And cropland makes up 43%. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize this for right now. Now, if we turn on the 2003 land use, what we're going to see here is basically there's a change I go between the two. So there's 1970, there's 2003. And what you should notice right away is that there's really more residential land than there used to be. So the assignment uh, for this exercise is for you to basically calculate this out for the 1970 land use, calculate this out for the 2003 land use, and then tell us what the change in land use percentage is between the two time periods. Now, within your lesson, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull this up here. This is basically the very last thing you're going to do for data frame properties. Now, in the uh, slide 18, it uh, basically says um, you're going to do something in Excel. So inside the Moodle here at the top, there's a little attachments button. And when you hit that, you're going to open up your module D assignment. This is going to open up an Excel spreadsheet hopefully very quickly. And in our Excel spreadsheet, there's some information that you're going to fill out. Uh, basically, you're going to complete this table, and you're going to give us the information that we would like to know. So this is how we can make sure that you successfully calculated all the data values. So it's a little bit of work, but um, the practice will be good for you. And uh, this will end my demonstration of the data frame 
exercise. Go ahead and close everything out here. I hope you enjoy this exercise and have a great day.